origin of Alexandria. Origen lived from 186 to 253, and about him, Joseph Lynch, the church historian, whose textbook I, uh, I really appreciate, he said, Origen was the most important Christian thinker between Paul in the first century and Augustine in the fifth century. Hello, this guy is a heavy hitter. Most significant, most important Christian thinker between Paul and Augustine from the first century to the fifth century. Origen grew up in a Christian home in the third century, well, at the end of the second century. His father had him memorize huge chunks of scripture. And Origen, even from a child, was brilliant. Eusebius called him, or Eusebius said of him, the boy studied excessively. <laughs> and that set him up well for life as a Christian author. His father, Leonides, was arrested for being a Christian during the Severan persecution of 202 to 203, the same persecution that caused Clement to flee, uh, brought his fa Origen's father, Leonides, to be arrested. Origen was 16, or maybe 17, and he decided within himself that he was going to go die with his father, that he was going to go turn himself into the authorities and say, I am a Christian, and he was going to get incarcerated with his dad, and they were going to both die for Christ. But his mother when he went to bed at night, his mother hid all his clothes. And so he was afraid to go naked, <laughs> and she saved his life. From that day to the day he died, Origen was in training for martyrdom. He didn't know when, he didn't know how, but he knew that one day the authorities could come and torture him and kill him for his faith. And so that colored the whole rest of his life. When his dad died... Origen was still only 16, had a mother and six younger brothers that he needed, needed to take care of. So he found a very wealthy lady who uh, allowed him to come into her home as a resident scholar and somebody that she was helping to get educated as well. And she had others that were in this kind of situation and that were in the home with Origen as well, especially a guy named Paul who was, I think, a Valentinian or some other religious persuasion. He continued, Origen continued his education in Greek literature and philosophy and Bible. He studied under a, Ammonius, a man named Ammonius Sacchus of Alexandria. And this Ammonius, who I, I, I would be very surprised if any of you have ever, ever heard of him, um, but this guy founded Neoplatonism. It was, it was basically the equivalent of having a Harvard education, what Origen had with Ammonius. Um, so Neo, Neoplatonism is the next stage of Middle Platonism. Middle Platonism is sort of like Clement of Alexandria, Philo. Origen is on the cutting edge of the newest form of Plato's philosophy on planet Earth. And he's studying under the founder of it for five years. At the age of 18, the bishop, a man named Demetrius of Alexandria, asked Origen to teach the catechetical school. Catechesis is the process by, we, by which you teach a new, uh, almost convert to Christianity to prepare them for baptism. So a new person who's coming to, their, to the faith is called a catechumen, and a catechumen gets catechized in a catechetical school. Makes perfect sense, right? Could be like a rap song. And so Origen was in charge of teaching newbies the basics of Christianity, not just doctrinally, but also lifestyle, to prepare them for baptism. Now, catechumens are also the most vulnerable, pe vulnerable people in society, in a city like Alexandria, because they're making a break with the pagan festivals, with the household gods, with whatever their family situation is. And so as a result, they can get, easily get turned into the authorities and executed, which happened a lot. And so Origen was with these people as they're getting arrested, and he's visiting them, and he's giving them the kiss of peace, and he's, he's uh, putting his life at risk, and a couple times even almost gets stoned by a mob as he's caring for these new people, some of whom do get executed. So then over time, he, start, he leaves that woman's house, and he starts selling books. He has a bunch of old books, and he sells them, 
and he's able to live frugally from the sale of these books. And Eusebius describes to, for us what Origen's lifestyle was like. Now keep in mind, asceticism was cool. All right, In our world today, denying yourself pleasure does not sound like an attractive, awesome lifestyle. But to them, it was the ultimate. And so this is how Eusebius describes Origen. By the way, Eusebius was trained by a man named Pamphilus, who was trained by Origen. So he's a direct spiritual descendant, if you can call it that, of Origen. Eusebius writes, For many years he, Origen, continued living the philosophic life, dismissing all stimuli to youthful lusts and disciplining himself with arduous tasks by day, but spending most of the night studying the divine scriptures. Sometimes he fasted. At other times he restricted the time for sleep, which he took on the floor, never in bed. Above all, he felt that he had to keep the Savior saying, urging us not to own two coats or wear shoes or worry about the future. By enduring cold, nakedness, and extreme poverty, he astonished his concerned followers who begged him to share their possessions. Yet he did not bend. For many years, he is said to have walked shoeless, to have refrained from wine and all but the most necessary food so that he actually risked his health. This is Eusebius bragging about Origen. He's a proud, you know, sort of like student of a student. He's like, oh, you wouldn't believe the master. He wouldn't wear shoes. Psst. He wouldn't sleep in a bed. He wouldn't drink wine. Not like that loose Clement of Alexandria. You know, Origen was a real ascetic. And it goes even further than that. Uh, Origen was not going to stop there. He is like the, the superhero of ascetics. He's not going to stop there with just like denying himself basic pleasures. Uh, he's teaching both men and women, and there's a concern about teaching women in their world. Um, and so possibly in light of Jesus' statement in Matthew 19, 12, where it says, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God, Origen castrated himself. A procedure called an orchiectomy. Now, some modern scholars do question that this ever actually happened, uh, but I'm inclined to believe it did because it is kind of awkward, and Eusebius goes to some length to defend Origen for doing this because it's like not a standard thing that people were doing in Origen's time or in Eusebius' time. Um, but, yeah, he, he destroyed his ability to have physical relations, and so there, there would be no way for him to... Be, be considered a threat to have female students. Eventually, he transitioned to teaching only advanced students, and he asked a man named Heraclas to teach the introductory classes. Uh, so Origen starts going into deeper levels of Christian theology, and so he has his own school where he's teaching not just Christianity, but like all kinds of other sub subjects that are preparatory for Christianity. His, his bishop, Demetrius, would not ordain Origen to be a deacon, a presbyter, or certainly not a bishop. He, he, he wouldn't ordain him to anything. And my suspicion is that Demetrius was just jealous. I mean, this guy is a superstar. He's already starting to, to, to have a following. He's somewhat of a celebrity. He's weird. He's brilliant. He's, he's well-known. And so instead of recognizing him and bringing him into the church... Demetrius doesn't do anything, really. So Origen is traveling. He's starting to travel. He goes to Caesarea. And while he's there, the bishop says, Origen, would you teach our people? You're a brilliant scholar. Would you teach our people? So he preaches in the church at which there are other bishops and presbyters in attendance. And word gets back to Demetrius. And he's just flaming mad that Origen would do this. And so the bishop of the church of Caesarea has to write a letter to the bishop of Alexandria saying, look, it's not a big deal. We have non-ordained people preach at our church occasionally. And here, here are some other churches that also allow this practice. And they kind of calm it down. But then, um, over time, tensions start to mount again. Origen, once again, is out of town, this time uh, to escape a persecution. And while he is gone... Uh, in Caesarea, the uh, bishop there ordains him a, a priest, ordains Origen. 
And so word gets back to Demetrius again, and he's like, I can't believe you ordained my guy a priest, you know, that's my job. And you can see this tendency in the bishops of Alexandria in particular to consolidate authority in an effort to be the one that calls the shots in, 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 that, part, in that major city. And this is something that we're going to see over time, not just with Demetrius, but with his uh, the bishops who came after him until we get to Dioscoros, and I'll tell you all about that later. But Origen basically just said, you know what? I'm out of here. At 49 years old, he packed up everything. He said, you don't appreciate me in Alexandria. I don't know if he said that, but he, uh, he said, I'm out of here. And he moved all his books, everything he had to Caesarea and settled there with his library that later Eusebius came to be the librarian of Origen's library at Caesarea. That was in the year 234, when he was 49. He was a celebrity, just like straight up classic celebrity. He was, he was famous in Alexandria, he was famous in Caesarea, he was, his fame spread to Rome, he's invited to visit churches, he's invited to speak, he's invited to settle disputes. A woman named Julia Mamia, the mother of the emperor, Alexander Severus, invited him to meet her. So like, top-notch political people are like interested in what Origen has to say. And yet, he wasn't recognized in his own home <laughs> in Alexandria. It's a funny thing. Jesus, Jesus talked about that, right? All right, let's talk about the text of Scripture. Origen, like I told you, he's brilliant, uh, and he really cares about the Bible. He really cares about the text of Scripture. He loved the Bible. He memorized big parts of it. I told you that. He studied it constantly, and he strongly believed it was inspired by God. I love this way he talks about inspiration of Scripture and how we can um, understand Scripture harmonizing and fitting together. This is from his commentary on Matthew chapter 2. He says, For as the different chords of the Psalter or the lyre, each of which gives forth a certain sound of its own, which seems unlike the sound of another chord, are thought by a man who is not musical and ignorant of the principle of musical harmony to be inharmonious because of the dissimilarity of the sounds. So those who are not skilled in hearing the harmony of God in the sacred scriptures think that the old is not in harmony with the new, Marcion, or the prophets with the law, or the gospels with one another, or the apostle with the gospel, or with himself, or with the other apostles. But he who comes instructed in the music of God, being a man wise in word and deed, and on this account, like another David, which is by interpretation, skillful with the hand, will bring out the sound of the music of God. Having learned from this at the right time to strike the chords, now the chords of the law, now the gospel chords in harmony with them, and again, the prophetic chords, and when reason demands it, the apostolic chords, which are in harmony with the prophetic, likewise the apostolic with those of the gospels. For he knows that all the scripture is the one perfect and harmonized instrument of God, which from different sounds gives forth one saving voice to those willing to learn, which stops and restrains every working of an evil spirit, just as the music of David laid to rest the evil spirit in Saul, which also was choking him. He had, a, he had a way of saying things, right? Wow, what a beautiful vision of Scripture. Really cool. In a letter to Sextus Julius Africanus, he said, uh, And I make it my endeavor not to be ignorant of their various readings, lest in my controversies with the Jews I should quote to them what is not found in their copies, and that I may make some use of what is found there, even though it should not be in our scriptures. For if we are so prepared for them in our discussions, they will not, as is their manner, scornfully laugh at Gentile believers for their ignorance of the true readings as they have them. So this is talking, once again, about the text of scripture. And Origen's a little concerned that he's going to be in a debate with a Jew and the Jew is going to destroy him and laugh at him because Origen is going to quote something from the Old Testament and the Jew is going to be like, Oh, are you quoting from the Greek? Let me tell you what the Hebrew says. <laughs> that's, what, that's, that's what he's worried about. So you know what Origen does? He learns Hebrew. 
He finds a, a Jewish person to teach him Hebrew, probably a Jewish Christian, we don't really know, but he finds somebody to teach him Hebrew, and he learns Hebrew, and he's like, we need to establish the text of Scripture. So the, the standard text that the church was using in those days was called the Septuagint. It's called that because it's like the word 70, the, 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 the myth of 70 translators, whatever. But it's the standard Greek Bible they're using. And there are differences between the Septuagint and the Hebrew Bible the Jews are using. And Origen is like, we got to fix this. Let's see what we can do. And that's where we get the Hexapla, the most interesting parallel Bible of ancient times. Also, the first parallel Bible of ancient times. So it's called a Hexapla, which means it has six columns arranged across the page. And in the first column, you had the Hebrew. In the second column, you had Secunda, which was a transliteration of Hebrew into Greek letters. So if you are a Greek-speaking person, which everyone in this world is Greek-speaking, you can't read Hebrew letters. But if you write the Hebrew letters with Greek letters, then or he, the Hebrew words with Greek letters, then you'll be able to pronounce it. Then in column three, he had a translation, a Greek translation of the Old Testament called, or done by Aquila of Sinope around the year 130. It was a very literal translation. Then he had another translation by Symmachus, the Ebionite, from the late second century. Then he had the Septuagint, the church's Bible, the church's Old Testament, with textual critical notes to mark where it differed from the Hebrew. He used the asterisk, asterisk, the same one we use today. He used that. And he used the obelisk. We don't use that. It's like the division symbol, like a line and a dot above and below, to mark certain parts that are different, whether it was added or it's not there, but it's in the other one and so forth. And then the sixth column was Theodosian, which was a late second century, possibly a Jewish Christian translation. So you can imagine him spending just hour after hour after hour. Reportedly, it took him 20 years to establish the text of the Old Testament. It was so big, it's so long, so difficult, no one ever copied it. So it didn't survive to today. We have fragments of it, uh, but the Hexapla you know, didn't, didn't make it through. So, sometimes your nerdy projects pay off big time, and sometimes it's just like, yeah, that, was, that, that, that took a long time. You know? <laughs> Spent a lot of time on that. Um, so once he established the text of Scripture, he wanted to interpret Scripture. And so I've got a little quote from you from his book on first principles, the preface that says, the holy apostles took certain doctrines those namely which they believed to be necessary ones and delivered them in the plainest terms to all believers, even to such as appear to be somewhat dull in the investigation of knowledge. There were other doctrines, however, about which the apostles simply said that things were so, keeping silence as to the how or why, their intention undoubtedly being to supply the more diligent of those who came after them, such as should prove to be lovers of wisdom, that's what the word philosophy means, um, with an exercise on which to display the fruit of their ability. This is snobbery. This is just classic elitism. So he's saying the apostles, when it comes to the basics, they spoke in a, in a plain way so even dumb people could understand it. But they didn't explain everything so that we intellectuals who came later could have, what, what did he say? an exercise on which to display the fruits of their ability. <laughs> and he's not being arrogant. Like, this, this is what he really believes. I mean, maybe it is arrogant too, but like, he's not putting it on. Underneath the surface of Scripture, Origen believed also there were treasures to be found. And he talks about that in his commentary on Matthew chapter 10. He says, The field indeed seems to me according to these things, to be the scripture, which was planted with what is manifest in the words of the history, the law, and the prophets, and the rest of the thoughts. For great and varied is the planting of the words in the whole scripture, but the treasure hidden in the field is the thoughts concealed and lying under that which is manifest. So what is origin all about? Well, early on, he was about the plain meaning of scripture and teaching that to the catechumens, the newbies that were coming to the faith. But as time went on, he 
allowed himself to get deeper into the more sophisticated matters and had somebody else teaching the new people. And he was constantly mining Scripture to find hidden treasures from within it. And now why are there hidden treasures in Scripture? Because not everyone can handle it. Just elite intellectuals like Origen. So for centuries in Alexandria, interpreters have been doing this with Homer and with other Greek literature because they talked about all these gods doing all this crazy stuff that was immoral and they're just like, that can't be what this really means. And they say, so what does it really mean? Well, this represents that and this really means that. Allegory. So just like Philo and Clement before him, Origen became a master allegorist. And he used it to combat Jews who said Jesus wasn't a real Messiah, uh, philosophers who said the Christianity was dumb, uh, Marcionites who said the Old Testament wasn't legitimate, and Valentinians who had like a simplified version of the Gnostic myth I talked to you about before. So he's, he's, he's combating all these people on all these different sides, and he's using allegory to do it. In fact, he thinks the Jews interpret according to the letter and Christians interpret according to the Spirit. As it says in 2 Corinthians 3.6, God made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. So, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Verse 14, but their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So for Origen, the Jews are reading the Bible literally, and that's why they're not believing in Jesus. If you read it spiritually or allegorically, then you'll see Jesus everywhere. And he does. He sees Jesus everywhere. Joseph Lynch says... Origen thought that the interpretation of Scripture belonged to an elite of Christians. Bishops and presbyters might or might not belong to that elite. I think this might explain why he had so much trouble with his bishop, Demetrius. Like he genuinely thought he was smarter than, than other Christians and that there were other elite people like him that could understand the deeper things, but like not that many. And Demetrius probably wasn't one of them. So his, his allegorizing established Origen as a guru, since the rules of allegory are really kind of willy-nilly. And you need an expert to help you along. And so he played that expert for sure. Um, he also believed that Scripture had a body, a soul, and a spirit. And that if the words you encounter on the page are just the body of Scripture. That's the literal meaning, the letter, okay? And then you have to penetrate, if you're a good exegete, if you're a good interpreter of Scripture, you have to penetrate beneath the body to the soul of Scripture, and that's where you get this metaphorical meaning. And in some Scriptures, there's even a spirit level, which is even beyond the body and the soul. It's sort of like the ultimate enlightenment of that particular passage. So what happens with Origen is he encounters... Something in Scripture that to his sensibilities is absurd or unworthy of God. And for him, he says, that's the cue. There's no body. This Scripture has no body. Let's, we got to go right for the soul. Right for the soul. So this really means that. This really means that. This really means that. Boom, boom, boom. Allegorize it. And guess what? You make it mean something totally new. So Origen quotes from 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 7, where it says, and I quoted this to you before. I think you may, may recognize it. Yet among, this, yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. He loves stuff like that. His example of the soul meaning is where Paul Reading Deuteronomy 25.4, quotes, Do not muzzle an ox when it's threshing the grain. And he says, Paul says, Do you think he cares about animals? This is talking about ministers of the gospel, that they need to get paid 
1 Corinthians 9. Look it up if you want. So Origen points to it. He's like, look, I'm just doing what Paul did. Except Origen's doing it everywhere. And he's doing it with the New Testament, not just with the Old Testament. So there are differences. In his commentary on John, Origen talked about how um, the heretics, the heterodox, are interpreting the text of the gospel and the apostle and how he's so worried about it. So his response is to offer interpretations for everything that he can. And Origen is smarter than the Gnostics and the Valentinians and the Marcionites and whoever else is around. Like, he just genuinely, he's got more horsepower in his brain, you know? So, like, he can just, like, outmaneuver them in conversations. It's really quite something. And so his response to, like, a Gnostic person is like, well, how could, how could, how could the creator God make the universe? It's got to be a lower evil god, Yal de Baoth. It's got to be Yal de Baoth. Or you could say, look, man, you have misread the Timaeus. You don't know your Plato well enough. Let me help you. I, ta- I learned under Ammonius. And, and by the way, that's Middle Platonism. We're on new Neoplatonism now. You need to upgrade your Platonism. Your Platonism's out of touch. In the Timaeus, it says that he looked to the perfect and he made a good copy why are you saying he made a bad copy and that it was an act of rebellion? You're a bad Platonist. So he would beat them on Platonism before he even got to Scripture. Incredible, right? And this guy wrote books. <sighs> the most prolific author of the ancient world. He wrote thousands of chapters and volumes. Uh, Jerome says that Origen had written 2,000 roles and asked the question, who can read them all? And Jerome is a super nerdy guy who spends most of his time reading and writing, okay? At one point, Origen fell in with a man named Ambrose, who was his patron, who funded him and provided seven stenographers to take his dictation and a whole cadre of ladies who expertly duplicated completed manuscripts. So he could could produce at an unbelievable rate. You have seven stenographers right out in front of you, whether they're all going at the same time or they're taking turns so that like, when their hand gets tired or however it works, he's just dictating his books, and it's just like boom, 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 and he just churns them out. So he doesn't write until he's in his 40s, but once he starts writing, he just goes nuts. So let's talk about the types of books that Origen writes. He writes commentaries, you know what commentaries are? It's where you go verse by verse through a book of the Bible, and you quote the book, and then you, uh, you quote the verse, and then you explain what you think it means. That's a commentary. He wrote lots of commentaries. He wrote sermons uh, or homilies. These are what he would preach in the church in Caesarea. Treatises on subjects. He wrote an apology. Again, apology is a defense of Christianity. It's not saying you're sorry. He wrote letters and theology. Let's take these in turn. On the commentaries, he wrote a commentary on Matthew, a commentary on John, a commentary on Song of Songs, all of which survive today. Um, Song of Songs, by the way, is one of the most interesting. He wrote tons more than that. This is just what survived. I think he wrote so many commentaries, they had like multiple versions of like the same book. um, (coughs) But back to the Song of Songs. The Song of Songs is a is a romantic meditation on a young in love couple that really just wants to escape to the garden and, you know, be together physically, okay? Here's a guy who's castrated himself, and he's reading this book. He doesn't, he just doesn't believe in sex. He doesn't believe in, you know, like, he, he's like, so, so what does this really mean? It's about Christ and the church. Christ pursuing the church. That's what this is really about. And so he, he goes bananas with the song. He loves it. He, he totally rewrites it, and that has a major impact on others later on. Um, his scriptural commentaries influenced the understanding of the Bible for centuries, says Joseph Lynch. He also wrote lots of sermons. Allegedly, uh, we have about 280 that survive today. Not all this stuff is translated into English, by the way, just because he wrote so much. You know? like, I've got volume after volume after volume of origin in my office, and I like, have only a small percentage of his output. 
Uh, then he wrote treatises on subjects. At a certain point, Ambrose uh, asked him to write something on prayer, or maybe he thought this would be good for Ambrose, so he dedicates it to Ambrose. He writes a book on prayer, which I thought was really fascinating. In his book on prayer, he says that you, everyone, all Christians should pray three times a day minimum. He says that prayer includes peering beyond this created order to contemplate God as he listens. That's deep. He says, if Jesus prayed, how can you neglect it? He says, you should pray standing with hands outstretched and eyes lifted up. Hold on. He, you can only pray sitting because of a disease of the feet. And you can only pray lying down if you have a fever or some such sickness. Now again, back to my disclaimer. I am just telling you what these people thought and did. I'm not telling you to castrate yourself. Please do not castrate yourself. I don't care how you pray. I'm just telling you what they said, okay? He says everyone should have a prayer room. He talks about the structure of prayer. He says you should praise, then give thanksgiving, then confession, then make requests, and then end with praise, hymning and glorifying the Father of all through Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit to whom be glory forever. It's a really practical wisdom that he gives for prayer. He wasn't just a nerd. He also practiced Christianity. He also did the basics. He says in chapter 14 of his book on prayer, Now if we are to take prayer in its most exact sense, perhaps we should not pray to anyone begotten, not even to Christ himself, but only to the God and Father of all, to whom even our Savior himself prayed. The Son is a being, usia, and subject distinct from the Father. That's terminology is going to come up later. We should pray only to the God and Father of all. Did you catch that? We should pray only to the God and Father of all, yet not without the high priest. We ought not to pray to someone else who prays, but rather to the Father whom our Lord Jesus taught us to address in prayers. Christ said, why do you call me good? No one is good but God the Father alone. Would he not also say, why do you pray to me? You should pray only to the Father to whom I pray myself. It is not reasonable for those who are deemed worthy of one and the same Father to pray to a brother. Isn't that fascinating? So he has a very high view of Jesus, as we'll see in a minute. He really does think Jesus is eternal, which is kind of a new... It's questionable if Clement believed that, but it's certain that Origen believed that. Um, and yet, still, he's a subordinationist. He thinks that the, the Father is superior and the only one who is the fitting recipient of prayer. He also wrote a book called An Exhortation to Martyrdom. His patron, the guy that's bankrolling him, gets arrested by the authorities, gets threatened to be executed. And Origen writes him this stirring book saying to him, you play the man, you don't give up the faith, you do what you have to do, but you don't sell out, even if it kills you. It's a pretty cool book. Uh, he writes a book on Passover and then other books Treatises on subjects he wrote, like on the resurrection, are now lost. He wrote a book on apologetics called Against Celsus. His patron, once again, Ambrose, said to Origen, I want you to write a book responding to, to the book that Celsus wrote. Celsus had written this book called The True Logos, or The True Word. And it was a nonstop criticism of Christianity, just beating the crap out of Christianity, saying we're dumb, we're stupid, we don't know anything, our book is full of errors. Just a really, really uh, nasty diatribe against Christianity. And so Origen puts him off and puts him off and puts him off, and then he's like, you know what, fine, I'll write it. 500 plus pages later, we have a thorough refutation that reminds me of a cat playing with a chew toy, where Origen is just like, then Kelsa said, and then <laughs> responds. And then Kelsus said, and he quotes Kelsus, and then he responds and just demolishes his philosophical arguments. Then we have letters. Eusebius had collected over 100 letters. Uh, we have a couple of letters of his that survive, that I know of, at least in English translations. Um, and then his book on theology, which is called On First Principles. This is the first systematic theology that Christians ever produce called On First Principles, in the Greek, periarchon, in the Latin, de principis, unless you have an Italian accent, in which case is de principis. 
Um, it's the quintessential combination of Neoplatonism and Christian theology. That's on first principles. It comes to about 328 pages in a modern book. I have the Butterworth edition, which is pretty good. And it's designed for mature Christians. Now, here's the, one of the problems we get with uh, Origen. Origen is easily the most controversial figure that we're probably going to cover as well. I don't know if that's, that's a hard statement to make. But he's very controversial in his own time and later. And um, <clears throat> so the version that we have of De Princip uh, what did I call it, on first principles that survives is from a guy named Rufinus. And Rufinus wrote a Latin translation of on first principles in the year 397. So that's over a century. Origen dies in 253. So over a century later, Rufinus does his Latin version. And here's what Rufinus says in the, prefit, pre, in the preface. He says, I changed Origen any time he disagreed with our theology. Like, he just, he just owns it. He's like, I just, I just changed it. So <laughs> a lot of the, the things that are said in On First Principles sound like later Christian theology. But here's the thing. We do have Greek fragments that also survive. And we can compare the Greek to the Latin. And we can see what he originally said in a lot of places, too. So anyhow, that's fair warning about On First Principles. If it sounds like a 4th century document, it's because the version we have is from the late 4th century <laughs> not the third century, although there are Greek fragments that remain. And the Butterworth translation I have puts the Greek and the Latin next to each other, so you can see, I mean, it's English, but it says Greek and Latin on either side, so it's helpful. All right, let's talk about his theology. Philosophers commonly looked to fields of knowledge like geometry, music, grammar, rhetoric, and astronomy as aids and prerequisites to prepare someone for the study of philosophy. Origen took it one step further. He would have him look at all that and all that stuff, and then he would say philosophy itself is something that we want to appropriate to Christianity. And he tells this, this, uh, this to Gregory of Thaumaturgus, or Gregory Thaumaturgus in his letter. He talks about how the Egyptians were spoiled by the Israelites when they borrowed the gold and the precious clothing before they left on the 10th plague. <clears throat> and, he, and he talks about how after they spoiled the Egyptians and took all this gold and stuff, that they went through the Red Sea and they came out to the, to the mountain of God and they built the tabernacle and they built the Ark of the Covenant and they built the, you know, the veil to separate the holy place and the garments that the priest would wear. All these things were made from Egyptian gold and pagan fabric. And so Origen's point seems to be that you can take from, you can plunder the philosophers for their ideas and their wisdom and reappropriate it for sacred use. <laughs> okay, does that make sense? And that seems to be what he's, what he's up to. So um, here is a little bit about his system. God the Father is supreme. God is incomprehensible and immeasurable, invisible, and he is a mind which needs no space to move. He begets Christ through an exceptional process. Origen says this is an eternal and everlasting begetting. Not beginning, begetting. The process of begetting is what a dad does to produce a child process of conceiving is what a mom does to produce a child, right? We have no mom in the beginning of Christ before he becomes a human in Origen's system, right? So it's just a father who's beginning. Origen says, and this is a quote, this is an eternal and everlasting beginning as brightness is begotten from light, for he does not become son, but is son by nature. That idea right there is fresh, for Christianity, it's not necessarily fresh in Neoplatonism. I found something similar from Plotinus, a non-Christian guy. But within Christianity, this is fresh. It's the idea of eternal generation. And uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. So Christ is begotten through this exceptional process. And then God creates a realm of spirits or minds with free will. Free will is very important to Origen's system. These minds did not direct their attention properly and fell. 
And this is how he says it in his own words. He says, the movements of their minds were not rightly and worthily directed. Whatever that means, Origen. So the, uh, the way I took a class at uh, Boston College on Origen, the whole class just on this one guy. And uh, my teacher said uh, he likened it to a school. Like there's this heavenly school where all the souls are like sitting in their little seats and they're all supposed to be paying attention. And one of them kind of like looks out the window. And as he does, he thickens and uh, starts to descend into the lower region, right? So, like, we're not paying attention rightly, and uh, maybe some of you can relate to that right now. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so these minds, you know, they're, they're not directing their attention properly, and they fell, and the degree of disobedience they, they commit determines how far they fall. So this will explain why there are disadvantages for some people in this world, why some people are born with defects, why some people have terrible lives, is because they were bad in their pre-existent soul state in the heavenly realm before they became a human. So it sounds weird, but like it actually does solve the problem of evil, which is a really tricky problem for all Christians and well, believers in God in general to deal with. He said that Christ alone remained faithful to God. He was the student who always paid attention. Our physical universe, through the word, God created a physical universe. Now, he doesn't create the physical universe as an act of rebellion. He creates a physical universe to provide a way back for fallen spirits. The universe is not evil or created by an evil God. Our world is meant to educate fallen spirits inhabiting human bodies to get back to their celestial joy. It's like a, a U-shaped pattern, right? So you start up in heavenly realms and then... You didn't really pay attention, or maybe you like pass a note to the soul next to you, and you just like, and then now you're born as a human, so like you have to kind of like live a good life or be a Christian or whatever it would take. And then when you die, your soul can go back up. So, but it's more complicated than that. Improvement is available to all creatures, even demons. All right. So let me show you the ladder of stages. You have perfection, the highest level. Those who are in the platonic heavenly realm, right? Then, if you were just a little bit bad, you became an angel. And if you're a good angel, you can come back, okay? If you're a bad angel, you're going to be born as a human next. And if you're a bad human, guess what? You're going to be a demon next after that. And, but if you're a good demon, you can be born as a human, right? So these are the, the stages of how the whole thing works. Now, it's not entirely clear that you get multiple iterations in his work. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to say, but it makes sense to fit with that whole system, this idea of kind of a reincarnation. Origen did not like the kingdom of God idea. He, he fought hard against it. We're going to come back to that later. He didn't like resurrection. He didn't like the idea of a physical body again. He believed in resurrection, but into a spiritual body that was sort of like a glowing orb. Um, his Christology, oh, and he speculated a kind of universalism. I wanted to mention that. Universalism is the idea that everyone gets saved eventually. And uh, typically it's referred to using this Greek phrase, apokatastasis, which is the Greek word for restoration. Okay? So eventually all souls get restored back to God is a universalist system. Clement had done something along those lines. Uh, he kind of invented purgatory. And so you can be punished for a while until your sins are purged, and then you can go up. Uh, but with Origen, it's so, more, so much more elaborate and detailed, and everyone can eventually seemingly get saved. Uh, on his Christology, I want to mention uh, the categories first before we look at Origen's Christology. In the third century, we have the same four categories I mentioned from the second century, including dynamic monarchians, modalistic monarchians, logo subordinationists, and docetists. Uh, I'm not going to cover these in detail, but just to say that all four of these are still there. The dynamic monarchians, represented by Artemon and Paul of Samosata, who believe that Jesus is a human being who did not have an existence before he was born. The modalistic monarchians believe that Jesus just is the Father. There is no difference between father and son. And that is Sibelius, who lives during the 3rd century, and Noetus. 
Um, and then you have the logo subordinationists like our boy Clement in Origin we were just looking at. These guys believe Jesus did pre-exist as the Logos, but he's inferior to the high God. And then you have the Docetists like the Gnostics and the Valentinians who believe that Jesus came as a spirit being who didn't actually have a physical body. Or if he did, he didn't poop. We talked about that before. So, where does Origen fit in this? As a Logos subordinationist, this is what he says. On first principles 1 3. Now I'm quoting from the Greek fragment, not from the Latin of Rufinus, which was bowderized. It was corrupted to make it sound like later theology. This is what the original said The God and Father who holds the universe together is superior to every being that exists. The Son, being less than the Father, is superior to rational creatures alone, for he is second to the Father. Pretty clear. And against Celsus, chapter 8, verse, or book 8, chapter 15. For we, for, me, for we who say that the visible world is under the government to him who created all things do thereby declare that the Son is not mightier than the Father, but inferior to him. Just comes right out and says it. These are ideas that would get you kicked out of the church in the, in the fourth century, the century after Origen lived. But in his time, he wasn't getting kicked out of the church. He was the guru, the celebrity, the one to whom everyone was coming for advice. So Origen's Christology in summary, he believed in eternal generation. That's the idea that like raised from the Son, Christ is uh, generated out from the Father in a, in a continual process. So he doesn't have a beginning. Just like the, the if, uh, just imagine a star that's eternal. The rays were always coming out from it, right? So that's the star would be the Father, and the rays would be the Son, eternal uh, dependence in that sense. He said that the Logos, or Son, is eternal and begotten at the same time. So that's fresh. He clearly believed that the Son was subordinate, as I already mentioned. Now, I want to mention to you this book, if you are interested in Origin of Alexandria. I cannot recommend this book enough. It is the best book on origin I ever read. Uh, of course, C.S. Lewis's statement still stands that you should read the guy himself over anyone who wrote about him, okay? So leaving that to the side, Joseph Wilson Trigg wrote a book called Origin, the Bible and Philosophy in the Third Century Church. And I think he did a great job, and I relate to him. I relate to Trigg a lot because he was a pastor scholar, so uh, I like the way he did it. But he says in his book, a corollary to Origen's identification of Christ with the second divine hypostasis of Platonism is the Son's inferiority to the Father. As an emanation outward from the utter simplicity of the Father toward the utter multiplicity of the world, the second hypostasis is necessarily less perfect than the first, or as Plotinus said, the offspring is always minor. I don't know if that made any sense to you. But what he's saying is that because this, this hypothesis, this being or, or person, this is a word that can mean either one, depending on what time period you're in, um, because this, this substance or being is out from the Father, it's emanated from the Father, it stands between the Father and the world, it has to be less than the Father. Because, he goes on, because of this origin, although he insisted on Christ's divinity, and utter difference from the all lesser beings was unwilling to ascribe to the Son the same dignity he ascribed to the Father. The Son, as a mediating hypothesis, is inferior to the Father and represents a lower stage in the cosmological scale. Only the Father, Origen said, is truly God. The Son is God only by participation in the Father. He found in the opening verses of the Gospel of John a grammatical construction that confirmed his evaluation of the Son's lesser divinity. There, the biblical author makes use of the Greek definite article in referring to God, but leaves off the article in referring to Christ, the Word, as God. The Son, for origin, is not God, but the image of God, the archetype of all rational creatures. In a sense, what we are in relation to the Son, the Son is in relation to the Father. Thus, knowledge of the Father is superior to knowledge of the Son, and it is the knowledge of the Father arrived at through the Son that distinguishes spiritual Christians from simple Christians who know only the Son. Similarly, it is appropriate to pray to the Father through the Son, but not to the Son by himself. 
This tendency to subordinate the Son to the Father, this is, this is where I'm going with this thing here. This tendency to subordinate the Son to the Father caused Origen no trouble theologically during his lifetime, since most Christians took such subordination for granted. That is a huge statement. Later, when the development of Trinitarian theology in the 4th century made subordinationism untenable, it brought Origen's theology into disrepute. All right, I'm winding down, winding down. Just a couple more minutes here. I'm going to finish this right off. He also had some unusual doctrines. This idea of transmigration of souls, that your soul like, comes into your body, it existed before, <clears throat> it's basically the same idea as metempsychosis or reincarnation. And it's not entirely clear that Origen believed this to me, um, a 5th century controversialist named Jerome quotes Origen as saying something that's clearly reincarnation. It, uh, it, it clearly fits with reincarnation. But <clears throat> I don't trust Jerome. I just don't. He's, he's such, a, he's such a, a, a nasty fighter that I, I just I can't bring myself to trust him. But the fact is, within Origen's system, reincarnation does make sense. So I'm really torn. I'm, I'm not sure whether to believe it or not. But there, that is an accusation that's made against him repeatedly, you believe in reincarnation, that's not a real Christian belief, that's not in my Bible. Uh, he's also accused of universalism, uh, a lot of people say that, I'm not 100% sure it would make sense, and there's even some accusations that Origen taught that the devil would eventually even get saved, and uh, he gets in a lot of trouble from that later on. All right, how did Origen die? He had seen persecution as a teenager, from the emperor Septimius Severus in 202 to 203. Then again, when he was 50 years old, an emperor named Maximinus persecuted Christians, and he escaped to Caesarea. Um, actually, he escaped to Asia Minor. He had been training for this since the day they took his father when he was 16. So he never even slept on a bed, guys. Like, he didn't wear shoes. You think you're going to torture this guy? He castrated himself. What are you going to do to him? <laughs> Take away his bed? His shoes? You know, like, you, you just, I, I kind of sympathize with the torturers. <laughs> like, what do we do with this guy? Um, so finally, the authorities did capture him when he was, during the time of the emperor Decius, when he persecuted Christians, which was 250 to 251. Eusebius says, that Origen lay in irons in the depths of his dungeon. Day after day, his legs were stretched apart four paces in the stocks. And that's all the details we have about it. We know he was brutalized and, and tortured, but we also know that they decided not to kill him, and they released him. And this will make sense when we get to our session on persecution, that like to get killed for your faith was the most incredible honor you could have. So they denied him that honor. And they sent him away, and he languished for another year or two and then died of injuries sustained during his imprisonment. The legacy of Origen is a little hard to calculate. Um, he influenced basically everybody. Either you loved him or you hated him. Either you were an originist or an anti-originist after his time. He heavily influenced Eusebius the historian, Didymus the blind, the Cappadocians, the guys who like invented the, the, the creed of the Trinity in the year 381. They were originists. Um, Benedict of Nursia, uh, who founded the Benedictine rule that the monks all used, he was an originist. Uh, Augustine of Hippo had a lot of originist tendencies from his teacher, and he was officially declared a heretic in the year 543. So he dies in 253. 300 years later, he's still rel relevant, and the emperor Justinian says, Origen, you're a heretic. We're going to burn all your books. And yet still so many of his books survive to this day. All right, let's review. Origen was the most important Christian thinker between Paul and Augustine. He was an ascetic who trained himself to avoid pleasure. He strongly believed that God inspired Scripture. His hermeneutic, or interpretation, interpretation method, was to peer beneath the body of Scripture to its soul, and occasionally, even its spirit, through the use of allegory. 
He strongly opposed belief in a physical hope, preferring heaven to paradise on earth and a spiritual body to a physical resurrection. He believed elite Christians should ponder deeper, esoteric truths that weren't safe for simple-minded believers. He interpreted scripture through the lens of Neoplatonism, always looking for a lesson on the soul's ascent to the higher spiritual plane. He believed the Supreme Father eternally begot the subordinate Son slash Logos as rays are eternally generated from the Son. A tireless defender of the faith he knew, Origen regularly risked his life as a young man and in the end suffered physical torture for his faith, eventually resulting in his death. Now I, for one, disagree with Origen's theology more than I agree with Origen's theology. Just, just to be clear. But I respect, I respect him for who he was, and I appreciate his stand for the faith, even though I think he got a lot wrong. <laughs> so can I, can I say that? Can I, can I say I like him, even though I disagree with him a lot? Um, so next time, we're going to look at uh, church orders, and we're going to kind of switch gears from looking at a single person to looking at a whole swath of time and how people did church and how they uh, you know, made converts and did leadership and stuff like that as we continue in our journey through early church history. All right.